Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the Royal Statistical Society. Um, it's lovely to have you here this evening. And we have a topic of great interest, I guess, to everyone in the room. That's why we've come. Beyond 2011, where next? Um, what is happening with the census? Now, I know um, just from seeing the people who are in the room, uh, many of you were involved in the uh, intensive uh, efforts that the RSS uh, took in the consultation period uh, last year and into this year, looking at what should happen to the census in future. And many of us were really quite concerned um, that something bad was going to happen. Um, but we were very appreciative of the fact that um, Jill Matheson came to us to ask for some help in giving an independent technical assessment of the methodology that was being um, taken forward by, by ONS and it's great to see Chris and, and John in the room who um, volunteered to be, be part of that and I don't know whether you realised what you were getting yourselves into at the time but it was certainly more than you expected but uh, I'm certainly grateful to, to you for, for taking that on and I know that Jill is too and I think that gave a, a huge um, weight of evidence to the consultation response um, that we and many others um, participated in. Um, uh, and the conclusion, I think, was very much echoed across the whole of the community that cares about the census. That it is just too early to get rid of the census. There is massive potential in administrative data, but it's not there yet. And the word we fixed on in the end was that it would be reckless um, to say now we were going to get rid of this, this, this wonderful thing. And so tonight I'm very, very pleased that um, Sir Andrew Dilnot has agreed to say a few opening remarks and Ian Cope is going to tell us where next with the census. Um, Ian's the director in ONS responsible um, for it and he'll tell us in more detail about what is happening and and how we can be involved with it. But Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. It's lovely to be here. It's always lovely to be uh, surrounded by statisticians. Um, you know, to be one of the coolest people in the room is... Um, <coughs> come on. You know, I know how we can do better than that. Um, so here we are, uh, the, the future of the census. I, I felt surrounded by census-related matters for many years. For, for 10 years, I was at St. Hughes College in Oxford, uh, one of whose alumni was Emily Wilding Davison, who famously locked herself in a broom cupboard to, um, in, in the House of Commons to uh, act seditiously with respect to the census, and jolly good thing too. Um, in, in my household, and I expect in, in every household here, at least every household which isn't a single person, um, there's always fighting over who gets to fill in the census form because it's so exciting. Um, <laughs> But even, oh dear, but even more important than that, the, the, the thing that first made me really love the census uh, was an experience, uh, I suspect, 33 years ago, working on the then 1977 Family Expenditure Survey and deciding that we needed better grossing up factors than 3,000, which was the grossing up factor that we used to kind of blithely to use in those days. And so getting involved with the census data and realizing what I think is the core of why we need data of this form, which is we need it for everything. It is in a, it's the kind of, it's the rock on which, as far as all, uh, population related data is concerned we build all of our sample based estimations as well it really is the very center of what we do in huge areas of our statistical and empirical work so it is it is of astonishing significance and it's something that the future of which uh, the statistics authority took very very seriously um, although it's probably fair to say that what the authority was concerned about was not the future of the census, but the future of population estimates, uh, with the census as a way of getting them. Um, but the authority quite rightly took the view that was what we that was what we were really trying to be sure could be preserved and could have full integrity, and that's why we were open to a very wide range of possible options. In the end, the view that Jill took. Uh, which was wholeheartedly supported, unanimously supported, strongly supported by the Statistics Authority Board, was indeed that it was too soon to think about scrapping the census. My own personal way of thinking about this was, was just that if we, I mean the research, some of which Ian will describe later on, very interesting, very exciting, and I think fruitful research that 
our ONS colleagues did while thinking about this, showed that we can get pretty close to matching the 2011 census data with the use of admin data, and that's actually terribly exciting. But what, what was absolutely clear to all of us was that uh, there was some statistical work to be done to go from the raw admin data to something that matched the 2011 census data. And, and we could have no confidence that, that imposing that same set of statistical work on 2021 admin data would get us to the true estimates for 2021. So the national statistician, the 2011 panel, the authority had no hesitation in saying, well, no, this is not, this is not the time. We, need, we still need that fixed point. But that's not the same as saying that that fixed point is all we need. In 2014, simply accepting that we can have accurate numbers every 10 years isn't good enough. In 2014, not to take seriously the huge amount of very rich data that's available, as well as the data that we can get from the census, would not be good enough. So the rather difficult task that Ian and his colleagues have got is while continuing with the fixed point, with the traditional census, also finding what are the best ways of putting that alongside information that we can derive from other sources of data because the authority board takes a pretty clear view that that's one of the things that we need to do, that it simply isn't good enough not to take that into account as well. So I think that we're looking forward to really rather exciting times for those of us who care about this. Uh, yes, we'll still have the traditional census and we hope to be able to use that to make even better use of the growing range of uh, administrative data that's available. So that's, that's some of what Ian's going to talk to you about. I'll be around here and I'm delighted that there are this many wonderful people who care about the future of all of this. Thank you very much. So just in terms of what I'm going to cover, talk a bit about phase one of the, the programme, the, briefly the admin linking work that we've done, say something about the public consultation and some of the responses we had, the work that Chris Skinner did and the recommendation, but then most, more focus on the future, uh, the scope of the ongoing programme, our high level plans out to 2023, and they are high level. Uh, some of the kind of key enablers, particularly around address registers and legislation, and then a bit about the research plans uh, that we have going forward. So phase one of the Beyond 2011 work was all about identifying the best way to provide small area population socio-demographic statistics and the objective was by September of this year uh, to make a recommendation. So we kind of come in six, six months early but also to do work on the business case and the cost benefit analysis and we're doing the work now around high level designs for implementation now that we have clarity of the way forward. So that was always the scope of this first part of, of the work and then we'll move into a second phase. So uh, these slide, this slide I think some people have seen in, in various consultation events and it shows that with the matching administrative data from 2011 with the census we can get very close within 3.8% or in the vast majority of the England and Wales in terms of uh, uh, the matching and it was this kind of work that is really exciting. We didn't get access to some of this detailed data till uh, January last year and it's progressed much faster than we originally expected. <coughs> This is uh, some work that we've done recently, partly in response to Chris's report that looks at uh, OA level data, you know, typically 250, 300 households, and shows that within 90% of OAs, we can get within 10% of the census count, i.e. within about 30 odd people. So even actually quite small areas, uh, small areas, you can get pretty good using administrative data. So these are the two approaches that we consulted on, which you'll all be familiar with, a census once a decade, but primarily online, or a census based on administrative data and a large survey, 4% household survey and a 1% coverage survey. And uh, the 12-week consultation ran till middle of December. Uh, the, the review that, uh, that John's alluded to, that Chris led, uh, we published that on the 1st of November and you know, essentially that basically said that uh, content with the move to the online census and that we understand the issues, but the admin data and social and survey, whilst there was potential there, it's not yet proven and uh, a number of outstanding issues. And that was something that we took on board and that was fed back to us through the consultation very, very strongly. 
So these are the list of 35 to 40 events that we spoke at during that uh, consultation period and you know, more than 500 people attended various events and uh, various members of the RSS and the statistical community were involved in a number of those. But we, we held things at the House of Commons, uh, we met with privacy groups as well as various statistical and user groups. So that's just there, just a kind of a range of uh, consultation events. And Alice Decorder, who's sat in the audience here, led all that kind of stakeholder engagement. Uh, we had over 700 responses, uh, you know, 450 odd from individuals, most of which were uh, focused around genealogy and family history and 273 or, uh, from organisations, the vast bulk of which were from local or subnational government. But again, you can see the range of users that responded to the consultation, including businesses, academics, uh, uh, charities and think tanks, etc. So a really, really strong and positive uh, response to the consultation. I picked out a few of the um, uh, responses. I've read quite a few of the sort of detailed responses, and there's some really rich information there. So the things from the Information Commissioner's Office actually are really important, that they have confidence. Uh, the Commissioner has confidence in the ONS's approach to data protection as demonstrated by previous censuses. There's some really, when you actually read that response, there's some really strong endorsement of ONS and privacy. Public Health England, you know, the census is the only source of data that identifies all groups. Without the census, to identify those small groups, health services or interventions uh, may not be planned or provided in adequate numbers and locations. And then we got a really nice response from Boris. Um, consider the decennial census, online census to be the only option to deliver statistics required from, uh, for London and that the, the GLA and London councils will work with uh, the ONS to move that forward. And that's just a, you know, a very small sample from the, uh, uh, the large number of responses we had. So um, 700 plus really well considered uh, responses, recognition of the need for change, Population statistics highly valued. Statistics for small geographic areas and small population groups essential. But the proposed 4% household survey uh, alone wasn't sufficient, wouldn't meet user needs. And a very strong endorsement of the census as a historical source. Also, they recognised the value of greater use of administrative data for more frequent population statistics. Uh, picking up on the point that John made, concerned that the decennial census is too important to lose until we've proven the alternative methods. And support for the online census, but some concerns around digital exclusion, uh, people, the elderly, that maybe can't use online or areas where broadband coverage is much lower. So uh, you'll be very familiar with the National Statistician's response, which we published on the 27th of March, and which is basically just summarised the best of both worlds, uh, online census in 2021, including greater use of administrative data. A springboard to greater use of administrative data. I think we laboured uh, long and hard over those words. Um, some of the media coverage we had, um, including uh, some of the, the BBC news there, that's the response to the PASC report, uh, which is too soon to scrap the census. So we got some very positive and supportive uh, media coverage on the, on the day. And also on the 27th of March, we published um, uh, some public attitudes research, and we've published today uh, more detail around public attitudes. So generally positive towards a decennial census, 75% of respondents don't object to uh, de-identified data being shared with uh, and stored by the ONS. 78% trust ONS to protect their data and only 6% don't. You know, it's a quite strong endorsement of uh, our, our trust in the ONS. And then when provided with uh, assurances around security and privacy, there's very broad support to uh, ONS reusing administrative data. And anonymisation in one form or another was actually really quite key to that. And we've published today some uh, work that we commissioned with uh, ESRC uh, that I Ipsos Mori uh, did around uh, public attitudes research. So uh, it's an exciting opportunity as we go forward and I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the scope of the ongoing programme. And there's three strands really. So there's planning for the 2021 census. You know, planning, development is a, be a huge operation for the online census 2021 census coverage survey and all that that entails. 
Uh, we're looking at uh, 2021 sort of output enhancements. How can we make use of administrative data to enhance uh, the 2021 census outputs? Uh, and then between censuses as well, what can we use around uh, population estimates? And then we're also thinking about, well, what might be in, we needed for 2031? Uh, and I'll talk a bit about some of the range of options so that we don't um, find ourselves in 2021, 2022, thinking, actually, we're getting another census again because we haven't done the legwork to prove things. So basically making sure that we're not blinkered in our research uh, in the next few years. So those are the kind of three strands that we're working on. These are still very much work in progress. So starting with the 2021 census, um, 2011 widely seen as successful. We had a 17% response online in 2011. Internationally, particularly those countries that are doing five yearly censuses have, uh, have had three uh, goes at this now, two or three goes. Uh, Canada, 54% online in 2011, and you've got the response rates there. So our um, operational planning for 2021, we're assuming at the moment 60, 65% online, and we think that's entirely achievable. Um, but we're also looking at, well, what does the online collection mean? What are the implications for that? You know, how do we identify those areas where people may not have broadband and so actually we might need to post questionnaires out? What's the operation going to look like? Uh, how will the public react? Uh, in 2011, we sent everybody a questionnaire which had an internet access code. We're thinking about sending people letters. You know, what form does that letter take? So we'll be doing small scale testing around that. There's also opportunity to modernise the field processes now that we can expect most people to have handheld devices. You know, can we develop apps that we can uh, use to route people to follow up addresses? Can we have handheld devices where we can capture information on the doorstep uh, when, we, when we knock on doors that people haven't sent us uh, responses? Could we do email? Uh, you know, people register their email and we can do email reminders. We did some postal reminders in 2011, which we think got us an additional 4%, can we make more use, 4% uh, response rate, can we make more use of that to reduce the field costs? We're also looking at could we make use of the administrative data that we're hoping to have access to in the actual census operation itself? Um, can, can, can we uh, target where we have our 35,000 enumerators based on administrative data? We did some of that in 2011, uh, could we do target that more accurately? Could we use administrative data for item imputation? The Northern Irish uh, did this in 2011. They had access to health information, so we're able to use administrative data for imputation and, and potentially personal imputation. So there's all those kind of things around what does the 2011 census operation look like in practice? The uh, 2021 output enhancement strand, we're looking at, well, how can we enhance the outputs? Could we, could we use information um, from HMRC on income uh, to put alongside the census? This would obviously be subject to public acceptability and parliamentary acceptability, but there's been a long-standing, you know, 40 years request for income information on the census, and we tested that, and the, People in the UK, you know, they don't find that acceptable. Could we use administrative data on income, for instance, alongside the census responses? Uh, could we use administrative data to enhance the annual population estimates? So we have a kind of a, a benchmark and then we update with births and deaths and migration estimates. Could we have a stock uh, estimate as well, so that by the time of the next census, we're more closely aligned with the census counts? And then, uh, you know, basically opportunities to produce those intercensual annual population estimates uh, differently as we go forward. And then for 2031, you've got a range of options that we're potentially considering from a very much ad hoc piecemeal linkage of administrative data for all the way through to a full integration of people, businesses and addresses. Uh, uh, and you know, this is the kind of thing that other countries do that have population registers and business registers. So you've got this huge opportunity from one extreme to the other. We're not ruling anything in or out. There's you know, this huge uh, public acceptability and parliamentary acceptability issues, but we're starting to think about, well, where do we want to pitch ourselves there? 
The key assumption is that annual surveys alone won't be uh, um, sufficient and that we'll need to, if we have annual surveys, we'll need to put those alongside characteristics information from administrative sources. So we're starting to think about, well, what would that look like and how would we test, use the 2021 census to test some of these, uh, some of these, potentially use the 2021 census as part of that as a sample to test some of these methods. There, we recognise that there are some enablers that would uh, be necessary to make better use and full use of administrative data. Key ones are around legislation, but also the address register. So on data sharing, uh, the Stats and Registration Services Act 2007 has enabled the, uh, the uh, data matching data sharing that, that has taken place uh, to date but it's kind of slow and it's cumbersome um, getting access to the DWP customer information system data took about two years uh, to achieve for, for the various parliamentary processes and some sources aren't available through that there are legal barriers that mean HMRC can't share some of their data and it only applies to information that, that existed at the time of 2007 so it's been recognised and it was recognised in the consultation that new legislation will be required to enable timely access to the required administrative sources and for also any new surveys to be compulsory. The Census Act, the 1920 Census Act, is sufficient for a carry out a 2021 census, so we don't need any legislation there and there'd be a census order and regulation as there has been in previous censuses. So the Cabinet Office uh, leading on this and the ONS is working really very closely with the Cabinet Office. I'm the lead for the ONS GSS on this data sharing work and it has three strands. Uh, there's research and statistics, uh, fraud, error and debt and also what they was called uh, now tailored public services. So identifying those families that need most intervention from the state. The research and statistics stream covers access to identified administrative data for the ONS for this, these, these kind of purposes for the census and potentially for economic statistics as well. Access to anonymised data for the admin data research network and then also compulsory household surveys. So we are working with the Cabinet Office to make the policy case and to start thinking about uh, legislation. Cabinet Office since the beginning of the year have been leading uh, an open policy process and if you go to datasharing.org.uk uh, you can see where, where we're at on that and uh, the RSS are involved, uh, Heaton and I were both at a workshop a few weeks ago and you've got members of various civil society groups, uh, the privacy groups, No to ID and Big Brother Watch as well as uh, government in Open Government Institute etc. So if that goes to plan, you know, there'll be proposals coming out in the autumn and potentially draft legislation uh, by the end of the year that could be implemented by a new government if they choose to take it forward after the election. So that work is uh, we're very heavily engaged with. On the address register work, um, the address register was essential for the operation of the 2011 census and will be again for 2021. Uh, we're working very closely with Ordnance Survey and GeoPlace around keeping the uh, address lists up to date and we're particularly focusing on communal establishments. There are about a million people that live in uh, communal establishments, student halls of residence, army bases, uh, workers' hostels, etc. And they're, you know, they're really of quite interest. Um, and those addresses uh, are much, those, those address lists are much less advanced than the household address list so we're we're funding ordnance survey to run a pilot to see whether we can improve that and that's due to uh, due to reports shortly but going fairly well i believe um, this is a very high level timetable out of 2023 um, so we've done the options research uh, up to 2023 and the national statistician has made a recommendation uh, there, uh, there may be a data sharing white paper at the end of this year out through the, um, the, the uh, open, open the data, you know, the data legislation process, uh, and we're working towards an outline business case by the autumn of this year uh, to get approval for the kind of funding that will be required going forward. If we follow a similar timetable to the last census, we'll start census topic consultation in 2015. 
um, and um, small-scale tests uh, between 2015 and 2017 uh, around a whole range of the operational procedures, uh, question development, etc. And over that period as well, between now and 2017, uh, we'll be doing um, administrative da uh, admin data sharing research as well, and I'll talk a bit more about that. We're expecting to potentially carry out a large-scale test in 2017, 100,000 households as we did in 2007, uh, to prove the operation. And also, around about that time, to determine the role of administrative data in 2021, uh, based on the three years' worth of uh, research, data sharing research we'll have carried out. We expect there to be a white paper in 2018, setting out the government's plans for the census, both for the traditional online you know, census as well as the use of administrative data. Uh, and the rehearsal in 2019, again of about 100,000 households we're currently thinking. And to review the progress being made um, for use of administrative data out to 2031, so maybe we can build some tests into the actual 2021 census itself. There'll need to be census order and census regs uh, regulations in 2019 and 2020, and then uh, census day probably in spring um, 2021, um, probably late April is my kind of best guess, uh, followed by a census coverage survey, and then the enhanced outputs from 2022, 2023, uh, and then regular outputs. Thereafter, so that's the very high-level timetable. Now we've got much more detailed timetables that we're working on uh, to influence the uh, uh, the total costs, the number of staff we're going to need, and the annual annual profile of uh, funding as well that will need to be in the outline business case this spring. So that's a very high-level view. So it's quite scary already, actually, because there's quite a lot to do. Um, in Beyond 2011 kind of research, the next steps, we've today published our response to the, the Chris Skinner review. Uh, we've accepted all of the recommendations and we've given a short summary uh, against each of the recommendations. Some of them on work that we've done already since Chris produced his report and uh, plans going forward. We're actively working on a three-year research program and there's a research conference that's being held on the 20 to 21st of May. Uh, in ONS Titchfield. If you want to come along to that, you need to act quite quickly to, to get yourself registered, but I believe there are still some spaces. Um, and we'll be presenting that three-year research plan to the, uh, the, uh, the research conference and getting feedback from academic and other um, interested parties there with a view to firming up that research plan and publishing it in the, in the summer. We also have uh, an international peer review. Uh, we had a, a group with representatives from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and also from Sweden and uh, the Netherlands, so countries that have already moved towards administrative data. And we had a really useful, helpful workshop with them last, um, last spring, and we're running the international peer review panel back to back with the, uh, the research conference. And there's a bit of an overlap, actually. There's an afternoon of overlap, so some of the academics come into the uh, uh, international review panel and vice versa, so we're getting a bit of a mixing up and sharing of experience there. So at the end of that process, we expect to be fairly firm on our kind of research proposals uh, for the next three years, and we'll be sharing that uh, in the summer. Um, I know that there's been concern, and it kind of cropped up during the consultation, that the data sharing work that we uh, had presented was all about just population counts, um, that we hadn't really done enough about um, uh, use of administrative data for kind of characteristics information. In October 13, we published uh, a review of the potential sources of um, administrative data that might be able to provide you know characteristics types of information and uh, that's that's the list that we published at the time we kind of gave a bit of a uh, commentary on those um, again today we've uh, published a, a research paper that includes part of it four case studies looking at ethnicity household estimates unemployment and income statistics, so the scope for use of administrative uh, information for characteristics. 
So this rather scary set of charts shows um, information on household size from uh, comparing the census with the administrative data. And you'll, you'll see from the patterns, those are, those are 36 local authorities, you'll see from the patterns that they actually match pretty well. So you've got uh, percentages along the bottom and the household sides up one person, two person, three person, four person, five person households up the left hand side. Um, the, the key message is that the administrative sources tend to underestimate two person households and overestimate five person plus households and we think that's probably due to some lags in the uh, administrative data but the patterns are actually pretty, pretty good. And then we've also matched the school census ethnicity information with the census um, ethnicity information for children. So we've managed to match 89% of the children in the school census against the 2011 census information and their, their ethnicity. So the, and you've got their kind of correlations basically. So 95%, if it's starting at the top left, you know, 95% uh, are white, white. There are numbers actually in there in grey that you can't see actually, they do all add up to 100% across the rows. So what it's showing is that there's quite strong correlation for the main ethnic groups like Indian, Bangladeshi, but uh, where you've got things like um, Irish or other Asian or white and black Caribbean, you're getting l less, less good correlations. But again, you know, that's, um, that's hot off the press, we published that today. So just summarising those two findings, the potential for using administrative survey data in combination to produce statistics about population characteristics. You've got high level agreement between the children information from the school census and the census. Uh, household size is looking pretty good, but there's some, uh, some difficulties. And you've got differences in due to definitions and collection processes and classifications. And we'll be carrying on you know, looking into that research. So this is my final slide. Um, good progress made on the admin data research, but lots more to be done. We're developing the research plans and we're working, we're really keen to work jointly with academics, the ESRC, RSS, government departments and anybody else that can help that, frankly. And we're starting, you know, we're doing work around researching the use of administrative data for characteristics information. Excellent responses to the consultation, very consistent and strong messages. We're awaiting the government's response, um, um, but we're proceeding to plan on all three strands at the moment, and we're working very closely with the Cabinet Office on legislation and also with online survey around the address registers. So that's it for me, it's just to open it up now for questions, um, maybe to all three of us at the front. How do you want to handle that? Let's see, let's see how it goes, see if we can do it from here. So, questions invited. Who would like to be the first? Please. Um, <clears throat> the compulsory response to other surveys, like the coverage survey, mm -hmm. I know this is... Process that people oh, sorry. Uh, the compulsory response to other surveys. I know this is something that other countries do, and I've seen this in everything that's been published, but I've never seen anybody comment on the public acceptability. I wondered if you'd done any research about what the public think about this, because this is new to this country, even if it's not new elsewhere. Yes, some countries like the Australians, for instance, have uh, compulsory household surveys, and the, the Americans as well, although the Americans don't uh, prosecute. Uh, I'm not actually sure whether the uh, public acceptability uh, research that was mostly focused around administrative data, I can't remember whether it also covered compulsory surveys. Um, can anyone help me out? Um, Genevieve. Come up, so we can... This is uh, Genevieve Groom, who's uh, in part of the team. Um, so the and a microphone as well, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, take, take the take the road, that's probably slightly more. Um, the public acceptability um, research that we have done has largely focused, well it has pretty much focused on um, the acceptability of um, data sharing and data linking of personal data. Um, so we haven't done anything as yet on compulsory surveys and the public acceptability of that. Although, yeah. So that's something we can take forward. Thank you.
Heath Hand and then Simon. And can you hold the microphone quite close to your mouth when you speak into it, please? It's, it's not picking up. I'm Heath Hand from the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, in terms of the process, can you say a bit about the government's response and the time frame for that uh, and you know if you've got any sense of what that might be uh, and then secondly um, we're in obviously a quite febrile environment around the whole issue of data sharing since the care.data fiasco um, can you say a bit about what should we as a collective community who believe that data sharing can give really important things for research and statistics do to make the case so that it's not dominated by, uh, you know, the kind of hiccups we've seen in health and, and the sort of perhaps a, a small number of people very concerned with privacy issues. Andrew, did you want to pick up on the government's response? I think probably you're better, you're closer to that uh, than I am. This one, yes, very good. Um, so the, the government made a, a kind of a response on the day that we that we published our recommendation and said that that they welcomed it and could see that there was, I think good work being done. I think there, uh, um, let's go off the record just for a moment, I think they're, they're, in, they're facing exactly the same sets of issues that you've described, Heath, and that, that I think by and large they can see many attractions in the sharing of data, but uh, in these next few months, I think picking the, picking the optimal time is going to be difficult for them. And, and, and my own sense, it's not some, so I'm, I'm now speaking personally, is that I don't especially want to push them to respond quickly because I don't necessarily want them to respond while there is this rather febrile atmosphere. Having said all of that, all of the indications are they were very happy with this recommendation. Uh, they have published, they published their own kind of consolidated response to the consultation document, which was another important element of what, what informed our decisions. And, uh, I, mean, I think, in a sense, one of the reasons why there's been relatively little coverage since we made our recommendation is that most people think it's the right thing to be doing and can see the attractions of all the sorts of things that Ian has talked about. So I'm, I'm reasonably confident that, uh, that government wants to support this and, and that I think any government, a government with small g, would want to support this. We are, as you rightly say, in the throes of a slightly febrile and not always well-informed debate at the moment. I think in terms of what, what we as a whole community can do, I think emphasising the extent to which administrative data is already being used. Now, at one level, census data is a form of administrative data. We've had census data for 200 years and there have been no serious breaches. The ONS, among other people, have got very good record of maintaining very strong confidentiality. And it's also true, of course, that we have, we've used significant amounts of admin data even in the 2011 census. Uh, so I think emphasizing the pre-existent nature of this use and talking about the way in which by using it more we can get more value rather than giving the impression that this is just a, an entirely new thing. Because I think one of, the, one of the misleading impressions is that this has never been done before. I think what, what we're emphasizing is that technological change opens up new possibilities, but it's possibilities to do new things, uh, new examples of things that have at one level been done already, and I think emphasizing that is probably quite important in the political debate. Thank you. Just, Simon, well, can, I just, can I just follow on that? So, so in terms of the, 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 I think the Cabinet Office's um, open, po open policy development process is actually really very um, wise in this space. Um, if they had tried to force it through and come up with legislation that didn't have some broad level of um, support from the civil society groups, it would have been doomed to fail, I think. So I think actually, and that's a relatively new thing, that the new thing in government, actually not many, uh, not, there aren't many examples of it. So I think engaging fully through that process, as I know the RSS is, and you know, looking at the websites and commenting, I think there's an opportunity to blog, etc., and, and comment online, and that's good. Um, specific examples of the use, potential use of data sharing. Uh, so we're, we've made the case very strongly um, for population statistics, but we're also working on the examples and the case for uh, uh, economic statistics as well, yeah, the, the benefits to measures of GDP or uh, the potential benefits to Bank of Users in England and other users from data sharing that will enable us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. So 
examples of specific um, data shares and their potential benefits. I think that's really helpful and important. Thank you. Over this way, then to the front, and then to the back. Maximising the amount of travel for you, Olivia. <laughs> Uh, Simon Brisker. Um, it, it was said in some quarters that the plans for 2021 as laid out were, were, were not overly ambitious, let's put it that way. And uh, you know, you all know more than me, but I think the use of more admin data in the census has been talked about in circles like this and within the ONS for 20 years or more. And in, in that sense, I just wondered why a little more progress hasn't been made over that time. Um, and secondly, I mean, just listening to the presentation, are we to take it that the results from 2021 are essentially going to be exactly the same as the outputs from 2011? So picking up on the first bit, I mean, the real barrier that's prevented um, progress has actually been the legislative uh, piece. So back in 2003, uh, Peter Benton and I presented, I think, in this room, and uh, no, actually was up by Russell Square, um, our vision of an integrated population statistics system that was very much about bringing together um, census and administrative data and household survey, but we couldn't progress to that because the, there was no data sharing legislation to allow it. It's only the fact of the SRSA uh, that's actually enabled any of the data sharing that has taken place to take place. And uh, as I pointed out, that process is rather lengthy and laborious. It took us two years to get access to the DWP, um, even just basic identifier information. So that's one of the reasons why we need um, um, you know, legislation to speed up that process. The Statistics of Trade Act, for instance, has got a very different process, which is much faster, and you know, ministers can um, um, push, you know, make that, enable that to happen. So the, the, so the legislation is a key barrier. Um, the use of the administrative data in 2011 was largely use of aggregate data for quality assurance purposes. Uh, in terms of the output from 2021, we have a completely open mind on that. Uh, as I said, we'll be consulting around the topics and the questions uh, probably um, you know, next, starting next year. Now, there, there typically is an ongoing need for people wanting continuity because they want to measure long-term change over time. So you've always got this pressure of users that want you to maintain the questions as they've always been so that they can have consistency over time versus others that want you to add new topics but that's still very much up in the air. We've, I've, I've, we have no views on that at all at the moment. Yeah, from my perspective, it would be quite nice if we could have a shorter questionnaire um, and make more use of administrative data, but you know, I have no idea whether that's going to be at all feasible. And those are the kind of things we'll have to test. Okay, thank you. Over here, it may just be that's a slightly difficult spot for picking up, but let's just check, check, check this mic first. Hi, is that no. work? No? Is, that, is that picking up? That? No, let's try the other one. Hello? Hello? That's better. I'm Jackie Taylor, CEO of Fine Binary, um, and I'm also a member of the Open Data User Group. So I responded as a CEO of Fine Binary on behalf of our Tech City companies. We have 3,000 companies in Tech City, of which this data is vastly important. And as we build our digital assets out from a point of view of making data centric companies, um, this becomes even more important. So, very much on that agenda. But from an open data point of view, I'm just wondering. We've got a number of initiatives. We launched the National Information Infrastructure. I've recently got funding from the Minister to do some administrative changes across local authorities and encourage that. I'm just wondering where this sits with the open data agenda and, and what your view is um, that, that contributes to it or extra things we should do, just generally open data and... So in terms of the census, um, we've had what we call a web data access project that's been going for the last couple of years, which has developed a data explorer and an API, an application programming interface that enables machine to machine uh, access. So we went live with a beta version of that last October, um, and there's you know, a huge number of data sets there. We've got something like, uh, I think about 60 or 70 registered users of the API, including universities in the States, actually. Um, and we're continuing, continuing that work and hoping to um, 
uh, go live with an updated version that's got greater functionality, but that's subject to testing and agreement of the timescales. So there already is um, a facility to access census data in an open format, and some people already are, but that's a beta version. Um, the full functionality will wait for what we're calling release five. Okay. And I'd like to go back to Alison, please. Alison McFarland from Health Statistics Users Group. Um, got two questions. One is about under enumeration and over enumeration. Um, when um, you compared your headline figures for England with the NHS register, there were considerably more people on the NHS register than in the census. Um, uh, now, to what extent, and this is also looking forward online, to what extent was there under enumeration in the census? To what extent was it that GPs kept people on their registers who moved on or who had died because they get money for them? Um, and so there's that sort of problem, that question. But the other thing is the whole question of trust. Um, when um, the whole background to the Statistics and Registration Act and what you've been monitoring in ONS afterwards is about Dis, um, trust in what government does with statistics, but the I, I would hardly grace it with the word debate, a can, slanging match about care.data um, has been very much about um, misuse of data by commercial for commercial purposes for profit. Not and there's been a confusion between legitimate. Uh, business purposes and uh, <coughs> greedy profit. I mean, nobody wants to you take unevaluated drugs, and we would hope that when we buy insurance, there is some evidence produced by actuaries behind what we're being quoted. But this has been blurred in the public debate or slanging match. Uh, but there is also the question of trying to get something sensible and positive across, which um, I've been involved in trying to do. But if you're up to a civil society group, bankrolled by God knows who, who has a full-time person on the job planting, uh, pay, um, planting uh, articles in the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph, and now has apparently two people um, em employed doing this. And for those of you that don't know, the user groups are sort of completely voluntary, so it's sort of our, what we do is slipped into spare time between everything else. There's a whole question about the capacity of getting positive messages across, which I think is very important, both um, for health data and for the census, but also any sort of cross-matching cross between um, NHS data and the census. Um, how can that be approached? If it's okay, I think I'll deal with the first question. I might leave Andrew to deal with the question about trust, because that's a much broader than just the census. Um, in terms of um, you know, over enumeration, the, the, it's well known that the uh, NHS register is, is over count, and we know that um, university towns, for instance, students register when they go to university, and they don't deregister when they move. One of the things that's actually quite uh, helpful there is looking at activity. So is, is there evidence that somebody on an administrative system is actually engaged with the state in some form? So I happen to have a couple of spare slides here. Um, this is actually looking at the lifetime labour market data from DWP. So this is 2011 data uh, with and without uh, the L2 data. So, and what the L2 data, lifetime labour market data, is a 1% sample um, from in, uh, national insurance and um, PAYE. So if it's the bit that's ringed there uh, is the straight um, admin data compared to the census. And this is when you take account of activity data. So those people who are either paying taxes or claiming benefits. And the, our colleagues in Northern Ireland and Scotland who have done some more work around this in the health space as well have found out that uh, activity data in the yeah, health sphere as well, where so evidence that people are um, prescriptions, etc., for a particular address uh, can actually really help in terms of that uh, over enumeration issue in uh, administrative data. So this isn't a particular health example, but it just shows that when you take account of activity, it can actually make quite a big difference to um, that particular issue. On trust, I'll hand that one over to Andrew. Uh, you see, I get all the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I and mean, there is no easy answer. 
there is no easy answer to this. Uh, my, own, my own view, I think, is that uh, part of the problem with, a large part of the problem with trust is lack of understanding and a naive debate. And so events like this and all of the work the RSS, all the work the ONS, all the work the GSS does, uh, all of the work that good newspapers and serious radio and television programs do, helping people to understand that the world is complicated and measuring it is difficult. Uh, that all helps when politicians do that which they ought not to do. That doesn't help. And one of the constant, uh, well, it's not attention because it doesn't affect what we do. One of the constant things of which we're aware at the statistics authority is that when we're, we're exercising our regulatory function, when we're identifying and reprimanding people for doing that which they ought not to do, there's a risk that in the short term, at least, that reduces trust. It ought to increase trust, and I think we're fairly sure that over the six years now that we've been going, the fact that there's an awareness that if you do something you ought not to do, you might get rebuked, uh, at least makes people, makes, makes ministers pause before doing that which they ought not to do, and that's a good thing. So I think there is, there's, a, there's, a, there's just a constant tension here, and I think that what we all have to do is just go on doing our jobs and pointing out when things are not being done properly and hope that the wider debate becomes more sophisticated, but it's a continuing concern. Might I add something before we go on to the next question here? I mean, Alison is, is right to point out that what's happening with NH, da, NHS data at the moment is a very bad thing um, and needs to be put right. And for those that haven't been involved in it, there's quite an important debate taking place in the House of Lords next Wednesday when they will be considering a series of amendments to the care bill. And the RSS has put out a statement this week putting out our position. So do have a look on the Stats Life website at that. Um, the problem at the moment is the situation is, is so bad, something needs to be done because researchers, Alison included, but I guess several people in this room are currently totally frustrated because of the moratorium that the government has put on, on, on use of the data. So they need jerk from one thing to the other because of some of the bad things that have happened. So what we hope the House of Lords will do next week is be fairly wise and legislate just to the point that will help restore public trust and enable legitimate research to continue, but not legislate in haste, which we've seen so many times, um, to make broader uses much more difficult. And there just has to be a much richer debate on public acceptability before there is a proper legislative outcome to this. And that's been a feature, I think, of everything that, that Ian has said. So watch the space for those who haven't been watching this thing on care.data, because it does affect all of us. It's going to affect the climate in which data sharing and data use is going to take place. The so more people can come up with examples, I think Ian's absolutely right. I mean, your Tech City examples will be lovely ones to have on the table that will actually hit the spot with the government and other people who are concerned about this but don't quite know what to do. Um, but feel they need to do something and I think our fear is they might do the wrong thing that could make it worse rather than better. Alison do you want to have a comeback before we go to the next question? Take the mic Alison if you would please. Just an example of uh, good practice we only need to uh, look to the west of here and if you look on the database of um, sales uh, I forget the acronym but that is the Wales um, uh, data linkage database. Um, it's based in the University of Swansea, but if you, uh, it's, um, if you just search on sale data linkage, and on their website, they, and, they, and, and in Wales they have a very comprehensive uh, data linkage system, so it's a secure anonymized linkage. Um, and you go to their website, and there's sort of two panels. One is showing the projects that are being done, and the other is about the information governance, and that those two panels, I think nothing is perfect, but that's an example of good practice. One of the challenges in England is a lot of the places where um, data linkage has been successful um, are countries the size of, or areas the size of Wales. So we look at Wales, Scotland, the Nordic countries, and Scotland's an honorary Nordic country even before the referendum, <laughs> um, Western Australia, and British Columbia, which has just hosted the International Data Linkage Conference. And those are all populations of four to eight million. Now, England is a much bigger population, and to have data linkage for a much larger population help, would help investigate, say, rare conditions. But we also know that our data are probably an awful lot more messy. Mm. And one of the things that 
doesn't seem to have come out in the care.data um, debate is it's sort of assumption. It's like a, you know, a multi-pronged plug and you just sort of link together GP data and hospital data. But those of us who've worked on the hospital data know it's incredibly messy. Mm. And goodness knows what the GP data are like. Um, we've heard about inflated uh, list sizes already. And of course, if the people who are less likely to make use of services like students uh, are the ones that are duplicated, um, there's sort of bias there. Um, another point which is relevant both to the census and this, which was brought out by the um, uh, President of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, the difference between an opt-in and an opt-out system. For the psychiatrists are very um, uh, against any opt-in because their patients are the least likely to opt-in and they're probably also least likely to answer the census. And so um, the uh, use of... Um, uh, um, it's not just broadband coverage and social characteristics. There will be specific groups which obviously you're going to be finding more difficult to capture in the census, but probably are already difficult to capture in the census and a paper-based one. Thank you very much. I think there was a question in the middle here and then over to the other side. Good evening. My name is Mohammed. I'm a data analyst with um, CQC here. Uh, the question I want to ask is uh, whether you have any lessons to learn in terms of implementation online delivery. Because if we go back to the National Program for IT, we know what, ha what happened to the National Program for IT. And also, if we can go back to the current DWP Universal Credit, they are far, far running behind schedule. So all IT projects, we can hardly have any examples of IT projects, which are government-wide IT projects that have succeeded. The 2011 census is well regarded. Um, the National Audit Office, Tim Bannum, um, I've heard him talk about it as a, a good a classic example of excellent program management. The, we came in um, on time, under budget, and we met our quality targets. And the government, uh, the major projects authority recently, about six weeks ago, um, ran a successful projects program uh, conference in London. And they had six uh, projects across government uh, speaking briefly, one of which was the 2011 census. So I think the ONS has got a strong track record of delivery in the census, uh, we obviously we do it every 10 years, um, and I think uh, we learned some serious lessons following the 2001 census, and I think it's widely regarded as uh, being a successful census. We've managed to maintain and retain quite a lot of the experienced staff from the 2011 census, um, and I think as an office we've got much better project and program management as well, so I'm pretty confident about our ability to successfully run an online census in 2011. Thank you very much. Over here now, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Anne Lawrence. I prepared the response to the Economic History Society and the Royal Historical Society. And I think there are some concerns that must uh, be in the minds of any people who work on long time series. Um, in the problems that arise from using administrative data, the collection of which the Office of National Statistics has no control over, and the difficulties, therefore, of ensuring consistency over a time period, uh, where, which will allow valid comparisons to be made. I mean, we all know about the politics of changing the uh, unemployment statistics, but I think this actually gets to a, a, a deeper problem, and I'd be very interested to hear what you, how you think this can be managed. I mean, I think legislation helps in terms of uh, enabling and facilitating some of the some of these data sharing. But in and of itself, it's not enough. You can't mandate in legislation that uh, people, um, you know, don't 
don't ever change their administrative data sets, and that would be naive. I think what's important as well is to have uh, the governance and uh, administra administrative arrangements in place around any kind of data sharing so that uh, there was an agreement, for instance, that if we went down this route, that the ONS was consulted during the process of any kind of change to administrative systems. You know, we couldn't, I don't think we could expect, for instance, that the tax system never changes because we were reliant on it for uh, statistics on income, for instance, if we were to move in that direction, or that uh, the national insurance system can't change. You know, Once you move down that route, I think you have to accept that there will be changes, but what I think becomes important is that we're part of that process of the change control, we're consulted, we can um, anticipate and um, uh, address those changes. What you want to avoid is changes to the administrative system that you only discover when the data comes through and it looks funny. So you, there would need to be a whole range of those kind of administrative and governance arrangements put in place too, yes, as well as any legislative uh, support. No, I don't. Can, can I add one thing on that, which I think distinguishes this problem from the unemployment problem that you mentioned. I mean, the reason the unemployment problem was so pernicious was it was down to changing the definition each time and making it purport to be the same thing, or perceived to be the same thing. The census is the opposite. It's trying the best in the circumstances available to measure the same thing each time. And I think that's the best reassurance to you, that ONS are trying to get the same characteristics using whatever information is available. So in 1991, for example, which is the first census I was actively involved in, it was immediately after the poll tax um, and issues around compliance with the census. It was a different kind of problem, but it was a problem of getting numbers that were, were consistent. But the reassurance, again, is we're trying to measure the same thing each time. And I think that's what Ian's setting out as what they're trying to do now. But it's inevitably a risk. Anyone else? Please. Um, two questions, really, ignoring devolution debates. Is there any economies of scale in joining in with Scotland and including Northern Ireland again? And the second question is, the digitally excluded people that you talked about, would they be um, invited to fill in the questionnaire on the door with a handheld device? Would they get a paper copy? My 89-year-old mother has never used a computer, never will, wouldn't want to give information to a machine, but would probably fill in a form. So the two questions there. We're working very closely with our colleagues in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, who, particularly Northern Ireland and Scotland, have very similar programmes. They're looking at administrative data. And actually, the day that the National Statistician and uh, Andrew made the recommendation, Scotland uh, also made a similar um, statement about um, making greater use of administrative data alongside the census. So we're sharing experience. We're sharing our work with them. They're sharing their experience with us. So I think that's working well. In terms of um, an online census in 2021, would would we have a contracts that include Scotland, Northern Ireland? You know, it's too early to say. Um, if they want to work with us on those contracts, um, we would. We would. But you know, that's uh, something that we'll need to plan out in our work going forward. In terms of digital excluded, uh, as, as you'll as you'll be aware. Um, the 2011, we sent everybody a paper questionnaire. The the Canadians in their 2000 and. Uh Six, the 2011 census did a small scale test where they basically sent uh, letters to 40,000 uh, people and they got much higher online response rate and you know, the lesson from that is the biggest barrier to people responding online is being sent a questionnaire. But uh, so the expectation is that the initial contact with most people would be a letter or a card uh, with an internet access code. Now we haven't worked through the years. We know that we'll need to offer paper questionnaires to those that want it and as we in 2011, we will make opportunities um, to respond available. You know, our, our objective in 2011, and it will be the same again in 2021, is to make it as easy for people to respond independently as possible. That's their right, but also, of course, it helps with our increase in the response rates. So we will make paper questionnaires available. The exact mechanism by which in some areas where there are very poor broadband take up, we might just send paper questionnaires out at the start. Others, we might, if we don't get a response within a certain period, then send a paper questionnaire. Or if somebody requests a paper questionnaire on the doorstep, we'll have facilities, again, as we did in 2011, to make that available. So 
that's all the detail that we need to work. I talked about the kind of research and development phase for the 2021 census. Those are all exactly those kind of issues that we'll need to address. But I think what's useful is the uh, countries like Australia, Canada um, have already kind of gone down that route because um, they run five yearly censuses so they can make those changes faster than we can. Thank you very much, Ian. Any last question from anybody? Please. Let's have the mic back in. Sorry, Olivia. We're It is an additional point, really. I'm a digital leader for the World Economic Forum. As a web scientist, um, what we've evidenced across the world is the change in nature of the demographic. And so part of the care.data problem is not, obviously, what, what was done was wrong. And, and for those of us that were involved with trying to change that agenda before they did it, the, we weren't we weren't part of the people that were allowed to say no and you know it, it was bulldozed ahead because the view was it was fine but for those of us that are involved in health we didn't support it you know i have clinical commissioners special representations and since then um i've been appointed as a core supplier to the nhs england and uh, we've got a new initiative to look at the trust and the permissioning of that but from the world economics forum's point of view we our work is now focused on trust privacy and citizenship post snowden so care data followed that what Ed Snowden did but it actually allowed an understanding that was really not to do with data literacy which is an issue that we all have to face and, and in terms of conveying what we're trying to say communicating the message differently it was to do with the fact that it was a timely reminder that some of these things have to be handled differently mm. for a generation that doesn't believe interest in the way that we did and the trust model needs to be re-established with them so it was a convenient vehicle really so we're doing a quite a lot of work we've just done some policy work in education that actually allows us to do uh, permissioned based surveys directly with the citizens so 138,000 citizens across the UK down to individual cities random sound Random, randomized, you know, with all the good statistical techniques, but brand new web technology to do that, to actually be able to say to politicians, this is what 138,000 citizens say to you directly. We can show you the demographics, the Archie data around it. More importantly, almost 7,000 of those citizens in the cohort, 18 to 20 year old, actually disagreed with the policy and said why. So there are new methods that are out there that will supplement this messaging to really evidence in a very different way um, that, that can't be ignored and sit alongside all the methods that we've used for a long time. So I mean what I would say is I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to talk a bit more about that. Um, because if I've got an opportunity of not getting to a care.data situation again, really like to do that. Thank you. Well, that's a, a very kind of hopeful message in a sense. There's some good yeah. things happening, but we need to keep talking and linking up these communities so that our voices are being amplified rather than, rather than separate. And Ian was nodding, I think, to, to following up directly with you. So thank you. I think we are done now, um, and thank you very much, Ian, for a marvellous presentation, but also some very full and detailed answers on some very imponderable and difficult <laughs> questions. So thank you very much for that, and thank you also, Andrew, for your interventions on the really, really hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for coming this evening. I think one thing it's, um, I found very impressive about this audience is the sheer range of, of um, organisations you represent, and I think that's one of the things we, we kind of like to encourage in the RSS, and it's very good for us to get beyond the usual suspects. Um, that can sometimes be a, a characteristic of, of some of the debates in the statistical field. We've certainly done that today, and I think that's because the census really is the bedrock, as Andrew said, and it does involve and matter to everybody, and it's been lovely to see you all this evening. Thank you very much for coming.